Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. San Francisco, California, 1970s. You might not think that that would be the pinnacle or the home of a evangelical Pentecostal church, but indeed it was. When Jim Jones and his family returned from Brazil, briefly to the Midwest, they set their sights on the Northern California town of Ukiah and Eureka, and then later to San Francisco, where they basically spent their time taking over the churches of other prominent pastors, spreading rumors about those pastors, and eventually taking their congregations. And all of this would lead up to the tragedy in Guyana in 1978. But today, we are going to go back in time to just after Jim Jones returned from Brazil and see how the temple flourished and also gave off a lot of signs of exactly what was going on there with it just being a hard up cult and how those signs were overlooked. But today we're going to explore Jim Jones and the People's Temple, the California years. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome back to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today we're heading into part three of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Today we're going to get into the California years. As you'll recall in our previous two uh, episodes, we dove into Jim Jones' childhood, his marriage, the early mental problems he seemed to uh, exhibit as both a college student and a and as a, a pastor, a later on a street preacher and a pastor, we looked at the rise of the People's Temple as a social justice machine in the city of Indianapolis, where he at, became, where Jim Jones had received an appointment as director of human rights and therefore used that power to swell both his church and his coffers. He was operating four nursing homes, taking care of the elderly, and was inspired by the teachings of Father Divine in Philadelphia to have all his church members give literally everything to the church. He had also started to exhibit fears of paranoia, uh, hypochondria. He actually was predicting an end of the world very soon uh, by nuclear war because we were in the throes of the Cold War by this time. So he started looking for a place where he and his followers would be safe from the impending nuclear disaster. So that kind of persuaded him to look around the globe. He tried out Hawaii, he tried out Guyana in the early days, but then he settled on Brazil where he met uh, a very prominent church, Assemblies of God a missionary that was already there, Edward Malman, and started realizing that Brazil was already too far under the influence of other Protestant churches, so there was really no place for the People's Temple there, and he was running low on money. Uh, Russell Winberg, the pastor that had followed Jim Jones from the previous Methodist church he had been at, was basically usurping his power, so he had returned to Indiana along with Edward Malman to kind of put the church's finances back in order. They did that, but there was a lot of infighting. One pastor left the uh, church taking half the congregation, and then the congregation from there just started to dwindle. Uh, he and Edward Malman had a falling out when Malman said that he had a vision that Jim Jones was going to push him to his death off the roof of the church, and also said later on that he could sense evil in Jim Jones, and he actually took his family and left. Because of all of these things, the fact he had lost his position as Human Rights Commissioner of Indianapolis, his power was waning, and basically his, his church dwindled to under 200 people. He then tapped Ross Case to travel to California, to the city of Eureka, 
in Northern California, which according to that same Esquire article, remember the Esquire article, he wrote or he read that was telling ten, seven places on the face of the earth where you would be safe from nuclear disaster. Eureka, Eureka, California was one of those. So he sent his loyalist Ross Case to uh, California to scope that out. Uh, Archie Imes' son, Norman Imes, was his pilot. They actually, fl he was flying toward Eureka, but during the trip, Norman reported that there was just no place to land around Eureka. So the closest place they could land was Ukiah, which was kind of halfway in between Eureka and San Francisco. And so that's where Ross Case landed and started to scout out. Much to Jones' dismay, Jones was not happy about that, but after he considered it, he looked at the, the Esquire article again, the map that was provided, and it seemed to be that anything in that general area of Eureka would be safe. So he fathomed that Ukiah would actually be a good place. So he told him to scout it out. It was a very rural area, not very heavily populated. So it was prime for moving, you know, around 200 members from Indianapolis to there. He also sent Jack Beam, remember his other associate pastor, out to scout that out, scout out California as well. But Jack Beam kind of betrayed him and ended up going to Hayward, California and kind of setting up housekeeping there for his for his family and tried to convince Jones that Hayward, which was a small city uh, across the bay from San Francisco next to Oakland, would be a much better place for the church as it was close to a lot of metropolitan centers and things of that nature. Jones did fly out for a visit. He kind of got all over um, Beam's case for choosing Hayward because he said, I said Eureka or the Ukiah area, not Hayward. What are you doing here? And it actually caused kind of a rift between Beam and, and Jones for the next few years. He also started, back in Indianapolis, Iams, Archie Iams was starting to get kind of sick of Jones. Remember, uh, Archie was the only African-American associate pastor in the People's Temple. In fact, the only African-American that would ever occupy a high-ranking position in the People's Temple. We will get to the controversy around that. But he was starting to kind of get sick of Jones' professions of divinity. Remember, Jones has gone from a simple street preacher to a social justice warrior, for lack of a better term, now to considering himself God because he's gotten under the influence of Father Divine. And uh, Iams didn't really believe that because Iams himself was a universalist. He wasn't a Christian. He didn't really believe in a higher power except for the collective good of humanity. So he knew Jones was full of shit. So he started to protest Jones' presumptions of his divinity and actually ordered Jones to please stop. And it put a rift forever. Between, I didn't leave the church just yet, but it began to put a rift between him and Jones. In fact, he Jim Jones was quoted as telling Archie Imes and another temple member by the name of Patty Carmel, I'm the only God you'll ever. We're now approaching 1965 and hostilities in Indianapolis are worse than ever. He, since he no longer has the political push of the Indianapolis government behind him, he's getting more and more racist threats, uh, especially people outside of Indianapolis were not reacting very good to Jones' radio show because he was starting to spout universalism, communism, socialism in a lot of his radio broadcasts, and it became downright hostile. Uh, the coffers, which had almost been drained by Russell Weinberg as you know, he stopped taking everybody's complete, or tried to stop taking everybody's complete paycheck, were starting to go back up because the hundred and, you know, hundred and just under 200 people or so that were still in the church were loyalists, and they were giving everything to Jones. A lot of them were elderly that depended on him, but he was getting everything. So the money started to pile back up, but even then Jones realized they had to get out of Indianapolis. And late 1965, Jones himself had a vision, conveniently saying that he saw a nuclear war coming down January 15th, 1967, and it was time for them to get out of the Midwest and get out west where they would be safe. So he rented some Greyhound buses, put literally all of his less than 200 members on it, packed up, 
and headed for California with his flock to Ukiah, where Ross Case had started to stake out areas where they could live, work, build a church, and fulfill the People's Temple dream of a socialist paradise. Upon arrival in Ukiah, he helped them find jobs. He himself took a job as a teacher at many of the local schools, so did Marcelin. They actually built a, bought a little house where they started to invite members to live with them, and they started living within just a few miles of each other and laid plans to start the People's Temple in the Redwood Valley, which was an, that area of California they were in, in Northern California, and to kind of build it into a commune where everybody could live together and have all their needs provided for by the church. But there was some discord going on, uh, namely Imes was reaching a breaking point with uh, Jim Jones' claims of divinity, as was Ross Case. Uh, it was after a bitter argument with Jim Jones about his claims of divinity, about the way he seemed to rule the temple with an iron fist, that Case threw up his hands and said, I'm done, in 1965 and left the church. However, he didn't find Ukiah, California all that different than Indianapolis, Indiana, because it was a very white area, a very country area, a very rural area. None of the residents took kindly to Jones' claims of divinity and his mixed theology of socialism and Christianity, and they most of all didn't take too well with the influx of African Americans coming into their midst. They still had a, there was still a lot of racism there, uh, the black members of the People's Temple had a lot of trouble finding jobs and housing, so Jim Jones had to actually rent and buy houses enough to house those members because the people of Ukiah weren't having it. They were, a, you know, kind of a country town, and because Jim Jones didn't have the political pull he had in Indianapolis, he really had to get out there and try to get some outreach and get people into the temple, so he started reaching out to the young people of the area, all the way out to Oakland and San Francisco, reached out to what you would generally call hippies. A lot of them had been disowned by their parents because of their, you know, anti-Vietnam War stance, their, you know, their beliefs in psychedelic drugs and the Woodstock era and, and all this stuff. So a lot of them, you know, kind of fell into believing that Jones and his socialist speaking, his socialist ideas were a good thing, and he did influence a lot of them to come out to Ukiah and join his church. He also started an outreach because Marcy had not only started work as a teacher, but as a social worker too, as did Jim Jones. They were able to get some funding for what they were doing and actually started a drug rehab of sorts, though their... The way they handled uh, the drug rehab was a little unscrupulous. It usually consisted of taking the drug addict into a home owned by one of the temple members, basically strapping them down to beds and leaving them there until the detox phase of rehab was over, uh, keeping them through, you know, the throes of fever and seizures and things you can have when you come out of de when you're detoxing from a drug, mostly heroin, and kind of keeping them prisoner until the the worst of it had passed and then basically lording over them that they had basically saved their lives. So you see a lot of coercion going on even in these early days in California. I don't know if you've ever seen the t uh, show Shameless, TV show Shameless. Well, the youngest son in one of the later seasons actually started something similar to this. He was rehabbing people for money to pay his tuition to go back to military school, and it was about the same. He would lock them in the basement, tie them down during the detox, keep them prisoners there, you know, for several weeks until all the drug was out of their system, and then their parents would pay them him big money for this. This was essentially what Jones was doing. A lot of these people's parents would pay money. The people themselves would pay money. He would get funding from the local government because he was doing good works. So, yeah, it was very unscrupulous, but he did get a lot of members because of this. He also decided to flood the area with even more temple loyalists by reaching back out to Indianapolis to the 50 or so people that had not come with him and asking them to come. Among these were the Cobb family. You had James and his wife, Christina, and his young son, James Jr., who was a senior in high school. The Cobbs had, for simple reasons, financial reasons, not come with the temple. Why? Because James 
Cobb had been with the local steel mill for almost 30 years and had a very comfortable pension coming as well as he had already topped out at pay. We're talking, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 dollars an hour in the 60s. So the Cobbs were doing quite well. They were very much upper middle class in Indianapolis. But Christine was a loyalist to Jim Jones and Jim Jones reached out to her specifically and begged her to come. And Jones had a huge influence uh, over a lot of his female members, especially, and she came. She basically told her husband she was going, he could go or he could stay, that she was going. James, not wanting to break up his marriage of almost 40 years, left his job at the steel mill, gave up his good pay, probably gave up part of his pension, and left to go out to Ukiah, California, where he did uh, odd jobs, carpentry, um, plumbing, anything you can imagine to make ends meet once they got out to Ukiah. The only person of the Cobb family that stayed behind for a little while was James Jr., who was an exceptionally talented athlete. He won scholarships in baseball, basketball, and football to many Midwestern schools, but he gave that up too and followed his parents out to Ukiah. And one of the first things that James Cobb Jr. said upon arriving in Ukiah, this place is too white. I don't have, and old, I don't really have a whole lot in common with anybody here. Uh, the young people that were there were recovering drug addicts, so not really a whole lot there. Uh, the few temple, young temple members that had come to, from Indianapolis, he kind of bonded with them. And James Cobb Jr. would become one of the leaders in the youth movement of the People's Temple, but it was very definitely a hard road for him because even though he wanted to be with his parents and had essentially given up scholarships to follow them out, he wasn't entirely sold. He still loved sports. One of the things that he did on his way out to Ukiah, he actually stopped in San Francisco and fulfilled a lifelong dream of a walk up try out with the San Francisco Giants and did quite well and was actually offered a spot on their farm team also in the northern area of California and started playing minor league baseball once he arrived uh, as well as uh, he played in some local basketball leagues and a local football league but Jones was highly concerned that sports was his main Main focus, not really the temple, and Jones wanted everything to be given to the temple. So what did Jones do? He basically took this young man in front of the congregation and shamed him for playing sports, saying it bred a violent nature, especially sports like football, and that it was taking his focus away from his church and he should be be ashamed that he worked on this young man mentally and physically. Beatings of young people in the People's Temple by the church were not unusual and basically manipulated this young man into giving up what could potentially have been a pro baseball career. And Jones' main weapon against young Cobb was his mother. He worked on him through his mother and this was not unusual. Jones would often ha would his entire life have a very strange relationship with the women of the People's Temple. They occupied some of the highest positions in the church in reality because they comprised what would come to be known as the planning commission of the church was, was its tip-top level right under Jones. In fact, they kind of wielded a lot of influence on Jones. And the reason being is if you go all the way back to Marceline, his to Marceline and then all the way back to his mother Lynetta and then Myrtle Kennedy, you will see that Jones has a habit of going after women out of the norm in a lot of ways, especially those that are closest to him. They're a little bit out of the norm. They go against social mores, much like his mother and even Myrtle Kennedy. They're strong. They're seasoned. And he also was very comfortable with a matriarchy because his home had been a matriarchy. Uh, Lynetta was very much in control of the house because she wielded the money, same as Jim Jones. He wielded the money over his members. So his early days really will, if you go back and watch part one, which I'll link here if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend watching parts one and two. Go back. You'll see that Jim Jones was pretty much effed all the way from the womb. This kid didn't have a 
a chance in hell. And he learned a lot of his manipulative behavior from his mother, from Myrtle Kennedy, and from a female Pentecostal preacher that essentially used him as a money-making tool in his early years. So he learned a lot about the wiles of women and how you can use them to control others. And so he had a whole lot of power over the women of the temple, and he used that to lord over the men by using mothers, wives, grandmothers against them. And this is how he reigned in both of the cob men by use of Christina. In addition to trying to flood the area with temple members, he was having a hard time finding a home church for them. He briefly forged an alliance with an organization called the Church of the Golden Rule, which was a commune-like church in the area that had 16,000 acres, land, dairy farms. They all used to not only sell stuff to the local area to make money, but they also used it to feed and clothe their, temp their members. And everyone lived on this commune, and it was a very happy thing. They even had a school at which both J uh, Jones and Marceline taught at. So Jones forged an instant alliance with his church, but then started trying to do a power play. He basically flooded it with all these temple members and these rehabbed drug addicts that he had helped and, and started flooding it, trying to essentially take over the church and their properties. Well, Church of the Golden Rule wasn't having it. They pushed back and Jones again found themselves without a home base and they started conducting services out of the members homes because they all lived within just a couple of miles of each other. There was also, as I said before, still a lot of racism in the area and a lot of the African American members of the church were not happy. They couldn't find jobs. They could only, and the jobs they could find were very low paying. So he started using more and more manipulation and brainwashing to keep them there talking about how he was a god that lifted them out of poverty and out of racism in Indiana. He would do the same here. They owed him. You also started seeing the formation of his inner circle with the associate pastors, some of the women, um, and they started essentially brainwashing everyone and lording power over them. Beatings, as I'd said before, was not uncommon. And to kind of glob on top of all this tension that was going on in the area. There was a lot of friction in the Jones family. Lynetta, who had finally moved out there, started drinking. She was becoming an alcoholic, a lot like Jimmy's father, uh, James James Jones, also stopped attending services. So you had his own mother living under his roof, not attending church. You also had Jim and Marceline sleeping in separate rooms. Uh, Marceline had grown tired of Jim and wanted nothing more than to divorce him, but she was afraid of him and therefore couldn't, so ended up living in the house with him, feigning to be a family for the sake of their children. In fact, many times Marceline tried to leave and was pulled back in. You also had a lot of friction developing between Stephen Jones, their natural-born son, and his adopted brother, Jim Jr., who as I said, was an African-American boy, the only, the first one in the state of Indiana adopted by a Caucasian family, and you started having a lot of friction between those two because here was Stephen, Jim Jones' natural-born son, named something different than his father, and then an adopted son that was named Jim Jones Jr. to prove a political point, and you had a lot of friction between the two of them. Stephen started rebelling against his father's influence, especially where his mother was concerned. Uh, Stephen loved his mother very much, and she loved him, and they, they developed quite a special relationship. Stephen would later on say that he never developed that kind of relationship with his father. So his father was very jealous of the relationship that the two had, and often used the children against Marceline. In fact, there was an instance where Marceline had started a relationship with a highly educated man in the San Francisco area and had wanted to leave and go be with him. Well, Jim basically called her on the carpet in front of this children and used the children to keep her there because the children, of course, said they wanted to stay home, all except Stephen. So you had a lot of manipulation going on here, not not kosher at all. 
Now, we're approaching 1969. The People's Temple has finally built a church and a communal type area in Ukiah. Their membership has grown significantly. We're talking four to 500 people now. All of them giving their entire existence to Jim Jones. So you had basically what he had always aspired to, that socialist paradise where he was a king coming into reality here in California. But he knew that there were power in numbers, so he always was looking to bring in influential temple members that could help him with the local governments that were starting to take notice of him and realize we've got something in our midst. Is it good or is it bad? You know. So late 1969, we begin the story of Tim and Grace Stone. Tim Stone was a young lawyer, uh, kind of a free spirit. He was from Colorado. He had been raised Presbyterian. He was a missionary for a long time in South America and was a civil rights attorney living in Berkeley, California. He was dating a young woman about 13 years younger than him by the name of Grace Gritch. She was from California, very mature for her age. She met Tim one day out at a political conference, and he invited her back to his apartment. The two began dating, and they became a thing, you know, a couple. They were they were very happy, very young, educated type of couple. They were both into arts and uh, actually very much in, into materialism. They liked a nice cars, nice things, had a nice apartment in Berkeley. Um, Tim wanted to make a mark for himself as a civil rights attorney and really was working for the good of people. He worked pro bono a lot. He also want, was an avid supporter of the Republican Party because he was kind of very much into material possessions and believed in the freedom to own material possessions, but believed all of that should be going toward the public good. So he was a unique Republican. He considered himself a liberal Republican. His words, not mine. So, he, in fact, he was often quoted as saying, why should the Democratic Party get all the progressives out of default? He believes there was a place for them in the Republican Party, too. He also didn't believe there was anything wrong with possessions. Kind of sounds like an early libertarian to me. I'm a member of the Libertarian Party. I we have a lot of, I believe that way, I believe you have the power to have nice things, but you should also help people and that people should be allowed to do what they want to do. So I can get behind Tim Stone. It was just weird that he went to the Republican Party with that, but Libertarian Party probably wasn't really a thing. Tim got a gig as a public defender and a legal aid lawyer in the Redwood Valley of California, which was down the coast from Berkeley actually up the coast from Berkeley in Redwood Valley, where near Ukiah. And he got there, he was kind of tasked with renovating the entire legal aid office. So he and Grace moved up there for a summer and were working to renovate this office. Well, some of the local townspeople said that a local church commune group known as the People's Temple would probably send volunteers up to help get this office into ship shape. And as Per record, they did. Jones immediately was drawn to Tim Stone because he saw Tim Stone as a highly motivated person, a lawyer, somebody that knew California law, somebody that wasn't afraid to fight for socialistic endeavors, and he could probably use this young man to help strengthen the temple in the area. So he immediately dispatched all the volunteers that Tim and Grace could ever need to renovate that legal aid office. Among them were Jim Cobb Jr., who had become a youth leader of sorts, and other youth leaders to help kind of bring Tim in. So you had other young people. Grace was about 19, so you had all of these youth members come in and kind of indoctrinate them into the church, invite them to church, and Tim started going to temple services. Uh, Grace wasn't so privy to it. She thought there was something strange going on there. Not really her scene, but, you know, she loved Tim and wanted, they were a young couple living, they weren't quite, they weren't married yet, so she wanted to make this work. She really loved Tim, so she went to temple services too and kind of allowed herself to be sucked in as well. Well, 
it wasn't long before Jim Jones had kind of sucked him in and Tim realized that the temple's mission of complete equality and everyone having an equal share was his belief. So he did officially join the People's Temple in late 1969, sold all of his possessions, uh, he got rid of their nice apartment in Berkeley, he sold his car, which was a Porsche, he sold Grace's car, he sold everything and donated it all to the church and moved to Ukiah. On Jim Jones urging, instead of working on the commune like everyone else, Jim Jones told him his calling was to help the temple strengthen their stronghold there and get some political favors turned in for them. Stone agreed, so Stone, instead of working on the commune, joined the DA's office in Ukiah as an assistant district attorney. Now, instead of living on the commune, living in communal houses like so many of the other members did, Tim and Grace were allowed to buy their own house or rent their own house outside the commune and live near the DA's office. So they had it much better, much easier than a lot of the temple members, which bred a lot of hostility with the other temple members. You had him pretty much working everyone else in temple-related jobs, in on crops, you know, cleaning churches, doing volunteer work, that sort of thing, at the behest of the temple, and then just had the temple take care of their food and housing needs. And then you had these young, rich yuppies from Berkeley, uh, a white, white man and a young Hispanic woman that was very white in appearance. And the only reason I'm saying this is that race would become a very volatile subject in the next few years. Now, uh, living and living as rich lawyers, because even though that DA's job probably didn't pay a whole lot, it was a whole lot to these temple members, and they were watching them live in much more opulence than any other temple member. So you had a lot of hostility starting to breed within the temple as a social order started to form. You know, you had the top tier, middle tier, and then the rank and file, which pretty much were all black. You had white people and light-skinned Hispanics at the top, and then you had the black people at the bottom doing the grunt work. So everyone is, they're starting to be little cracks form in his very forward-thinking ideology. Also, to kind of rein Grace in, he had, Jim Jones urged Tim and, to go ahead and marry Grace to kind of keep her there to keep Tim happy, and they did. Grace was kind of apprehensive to get married now that Tim was completely engulfed in the church, but she did, and as a result, Tim, as soon as their wedding was over, they had a very brief honeymoon, and then Tim flew, threw himself into working. Jones wasn't done with just him working 12 hours a day as a DA. Going, He had him going to political rallies at night, going to meetings, town council meetings, really pleading the advancement of the People's Temple there in Ukiah, so he had him literally working all the time between being a lawyer during the day and going to political functions and rallies, forwarding the cause of the temple at night. Tim was working easily 18 hours a day, and as a result, Grace was becoming very unhappy, um, very unhappy. She was at home at long all the time. Unlike the other women in the temple, she wasn't forced to work. So she became very, very defiant, very miserable. They also, uh, even though the temple allowed Tim and Grace to have more material possessions than the others, still that didn't make her happy. Also around 1970, you had another very influential family join the temple, the Laytons, Larry and Carolyn Layton. were teachers and pacifists. They both came from a Quaker background. Larry had a drug problem, and they had come to Ukiah for a new start. They had heard about this church out there that was doing these wonderful things. So they moved out to California for a new start, immediately joined the church, and Larry turned to the drug rehab services of the temple to kind of get his life back, along with his wife, Carolyn. They were both teachers. They also recruited in other teachers that they worked with in the local area. One of these was Bobby Houston, who had moved from Berkeley to Ukiah to become a teacher. And they invited Houston to temple services, and pretty soon 
he sucked his family, his wife, he and his wife Phyllis, also in, into the temple. Now, one unique thing about Bobby Houston, he's distantly related to me. I did not realize that until I did my research. I found out a whole lot of interesting things. So he was a distant cousin of mine who would play a pretty important role in the temple. So it's a small world, ain't it? So Carolyn became Jim Jones' first known affair within the temple. It was not long after her and Larry donated everything they had to the church, helped bring in new members, and were working also in the nearby area as teachers, donating their entire paychecks to the temple that Marceline and Jim's marital problems kind of boiled over, and Jim basically took Carolyn Layton as a surrogate wife. And he did this very openly in front of not only temple members, but also his son Stephen. His son Stephen recounts on a day when he and his father went out on an outing. He thought they were going out for some ice cream or something, but instead they ended up at the house where Larry and uh, Carolyn Layton lived. Larry was not there. He very He very clearly heard them having sexual relations in the next room while he sat there. It was about this time that Marceline had hurt her back. She was in basically in traction. And Jim very blatantly moved Carolyn into the house. And Carolyn took over mothering duties for the Jones children. It wasn't long after this that Carolyn and Larry divorced. Larry basically giving his wife over to Father Jones, considering Father Jones the better man, I suppose and but still remained a loyal temper member in fact larry would be one of the first members of jim jones elite red guard which we will talk about so now you had stephen growing ever more apprehensive about his father because now he's not only having an affair he's moved the woman in and is taking usurping marceline's role as mother marceline attempted another a sconce away during this time but was also wrestled back in by her children. Their marriage was pretty much basically over, only in name. And about this time, Carolyn became pregnant with Jim Jones' son named John, who they would later call Chemo. K-I-M-O would be the young boy's nickname. And he was raised right along with the Jones children in the Jones house. As a result of his father having a child at a wedlock with Karen and Layton, it was now another child for Stephen Jones to compete with in his eyes. Stephen actually attempted to take his own life by ingesting a bunch of his father's barbiturates or downers, which Jim Jones had continuously abused since Indianapolis, and attempted to take those. It was only after Marceline realized what had happened that he got the medical care he needed and did not die, but the problems between Stephen Jones and Jim Jones would continue to grow from this time going forward. And Marceline would start to try to shield her only biological son from his father's wrath, also from all the evil that she now sensed was around them. So now we have seven children living in the Jones house. You had Jim Jones Jr., Stephen, you had Lou, you had Susan, you had Agnes, and now you had Carolyn and Carolyn Layton and Jim Jones' son, Chemo, now living there as well. So this, as well as Lynetta and other members of the temple that didn't have their own housing. So you had housing bursting over. Uh, Jim Jones also around this time, this, we're in the early 70s now, adopted a policy of bringing in new members from all over uh, San Francisco, Oakland, back in Indiana, and he would house them with temple members. The only temple members that were exempt from this appeared to be the Stones. Now, Tim Stone was now working approximately 100 hours a week doing different things for the temple, and Grace wasn't having it. Remember Grace Stone? She just wasn't happy. She begged him to stop, spend more time with her. Let's get out of there. And as a result, Tim reached out to Jim and asked him what could he do to make his wife happy. 
and Jim generously offered to start housing people around Grace's age with them so that she would have somebody to talk to. And he did. He, a young woman by the name of Jeanette Kearns, who was the daughter of a longtime member that had moved to Florida before the Indianapolis flight out to California, actually moved out to be with her parents. And she was housed with the Stones, and her and Grace did become good friends. They went shopping. They hung out. Jim Jones allowed Grace, because he needed Tim so badly, he allowed Grace to and Jeanette to go out shopping to do things that other Temple members weren't allowed to do just to keep Tim happy. Also, Jim wanted to kind of solidify his control over the Stones because he did fear that Grace was going to turn Jim was going to turn Tim against the Temple. So not only did he start housing young people with them and giving her something to do, he worked on Tim Stone and said that it was their responsibility to basically keep the women of the temple satisfied. Uh, it was now long established and long known that Jim Jones, not in addition to Carolyn Layton, had had affairs with numerous women in the temple and men. Uh, lots of the men uh, had said that they had had uh, homosexual relations with Jim Jones. That came out even more in San Francisco, but so it wasn't, it wasn't unheard of for people to have a sexual relationships with Jim Jones, who was now called father by his flock. And he basically uh, pressed upon Tim Stone that he should take a lover outside of his marriage, a very young woman in the temple who had low self-esteem and was a single mother. She had had a very bad marriage and had an older daughter by her ex-husband and also two children by an African-American man that she had had a relationship with after her marriage, but was now a single mother raising all of them. Her name originally was Linda Amos, but she had changed her name once joining the temple to Sharon. And Tim convinced, was convinced by Jim Jones to have an affair with Sharon because she needed the self-esteem help, and he did. And Jim Jones did not hesitate to lord this over Grace, to show Grace that he could control her husband 100%. Grace herself also became pregnant, and Sharon Amos started to lord the fact that she was sleeping with Grace's husband over Grace and encouraged Grace to have an abortion because the world was overpopulating and Tim had no time to be a father and she was a selfish person if she had the baby. Well, Grace basically told her to shove it and that she did have the baby. Grace went into labor on January 25th, 1972. Uh, Tim drove her to the hospital and there John Victor Stone was born. And why am I telling you this story? Because a week after they received the birth certificate, this was February 6, 1972, Tim drew up an official legal document stating that he had asked his reverend, Jim Jones, to sire a son by his wife, Grace, and that John Victor Stone was that child and he was not the biological father because he couldn't father children. Everybody signed it. When uh, Marceline Jones actually witnessed it, so now she thinks Jim Jones has a yet another child. It would later come out that Grace had indeed slept with Jim Jones. Whether or not it was of her own will, we don't know, but we do know they did have a physical relationship. So now we have yet another son sired by Jim Jones coming into the fold, and he pretty much at this point has the stones underneath his thumb, and Tim Stone would continue to forward the political and legal legal rights and legal legal strength of the People's Temple. Also in 1972, Carolyn Layton's younger sister, Annie Moore, joined the temple. She had fell in love with what the People's was Temple was doing on a visit with her parents to visit Carolyn. They were kind of distressed that their daughter had divorced Larry and was now pretty much living openly as a mistress to Jim Jones, but Annie had pretty much drunk the Kool-Aid not to be crass, and she actually returned after attending nursing school 
to join the temple and became a nurse at the commune dispensary and medical clinic. Also, another young woman by the name of Maria Kataris joined about this time and also became a member of Joan's Inner Circle along with Carolyn, Marceline, Annie, and for certain extent, Sharon, and became very close to Jim Jones. It was rumored that Jim Jones was having a sexual affair with all of them. We know that this is confirmed by Maria. Wasn't real clear whether or not he did with Annie, but given his history, we're going to say yes, because that's how he lorded power over women. So you have what would later be known as the Planning Commission in San Francisco, now forming in Ukiah, this group of about four to five women that would lord power over the temple at the direction of Jim Jones. He also decided now was the time to further the growth of his church and to invade other areas of California, namely San Francisco, Los Angeles, and to get back out to the Midwest. So Jim Jones started deferring a lot of general temple funds to the purchase of used Greyhound buses, and he purchased about 10 of them. And he and the closest members of his congregation would board these buses and go over to San Francisco and hold tent revivals and church revivals down to Los Angeles and do the same. And then toward the Midwest, going as far as Ohio to recruit new members. And these became a huge event for the towns in which they did them. They did recruit a lot of people. And a lot of the people that they recruited in the Midwest, mostly African Americans, would sell all their possessions and come back to California. So you had a growing temple and a growing temple divide. You now have the majority of the people's temple being poor whites and blacks and educated upper middle class or middle class whites, liberal thinking whites. Among some of these new liberal members would be a young woman by the name of Joyce Shaw, who heard him speak in San Francisco, heard Jim, Jim Jones speak in San Francisco. She was an employee of the University of California system. It was there at a temple event. She met Bob Houston. Remember my good cousin, Bob Houston, who was also married to a woman named Phyllis, but though it was a loveless marriage, they weren't sleeping together, and he actually fell in love with Joy Shaw. Joy Shaw did with him, and they actually went to Jim Jones and asked for permission from Jim Jones and his inner sanctum to carry on a romantic relationship. And this was, permission was granted. But with some provisions, Joy Shaw had to leave San Francisco and move to Ukiah and pledge as much as 25% of her income to the temple, and that her and Bob could not live together. Bob still had to live with his wife, Phyllis, even though they weren't sleeping together and were married only in name. They accepted the terms because they wanted to be to together, but none of them would be very happy about it. And Bob, and Bob Houston and Joyce Shaw would be among the earliest defectors from the temple. Eventually, Shaw and Houston kind of got a bait of it, and they moved in together, even against Jim Jones' wishes. But because of their knowledge of, of marketing and publicity, both of them had been, um, Bob had been part of the original outreach into LA, San Francisco, things of that nature. And also while with the University of California, Joyce Shaw had helped put out a lot of the university newspapers. He knew that he wanted to publish a Temple newspaper that would go out daily, and he wanted that to be the newspaper of choice for anybody interested in the temple. So he kind of overlooked their open defiance of him and basically gave them the task of putting out this newspaper, which turned out to be a huge success, and they worked 20 hours a day on it. And eventually, Shaw would rise to the higher ranks of the temple, even as far as the planning commission, before she would defect. Because of the newspaper reach into Oakland and San Francisco, even all the way down to L.A., you had a lot of interest in the temple, so you had a lot of 
African-American churches in both San Francisco and Los Angeles invite Jones out to speak. So Jones and his people would travel to these churches and have these services and kind of seek to unify with these very well-established African-American churches in the cities. Among them was Macedonia Baptist Church, one of the largest African-American churches in the city of San Francisco. And Jim Jones really sought this out. He brought in all of his temper members. He swelled services. He brought in a lot of money. And the pastor, of course, wanted to keep bringing him in to bring people to see him. So he kind of joined up with the People's Temple as a common outreach. And as a result, Jim would actually house young temple mem members, mostly women, in the pastor's house when they were coming over to San Francisco to do missions work. However, when this pastor saw that Jim Jones was more about the power than the mission and was actually seeking to take over his church, the pastor said no thank you and basically tried to force Jones back out. Jones left but took 250 members of the Macedonia Baptist Church with him and left behind a litany of rumors saying that this married pastor had had a sexual relationship with the People's Temper, Temple female members that had stayed with him during their mission trips. So Jones is back up to his old hijinks of trying to take over churches. And it made a lot of these pastors look bad. He not only did it to the pastor of the Macedonia Baptist Church, but others. And he started to peel off a huge amount of members from these churches. And as a result, he started, he bought a huge church in downtown San Francisco. He bought a huge church in, down, in the inner city of L.A. and started People's Temple San Francisco and People's Temple Los Angeles, which swelled to hundreds of members each. Jones also heard that Father Divine had passed. Remember Father Divine in Philadelphia? Leaving his wife, Mother Divine, his second wife, in charge of his flock. Jim and his followers made a pilgrimage back to Philadelphia to Woodmont, which was Father Divine's estate, and paid their respects to Father Divine's tomb, which was on the property. Then, at a banquet that very night, Jones made a proclamation that he was the reincarnation of Father Divine and that everyone should follow him. Well, Mother Divine, or Edna, called bullshit, and basically it turned into an all-out brawl between temple members and members of Father Divine's flock, and Jones and his supporters were forced out. Before they left Philadelphia to return to California, though, Jones did send buses to the hotels in which the members of Father Divine's flock stayed and tried to recruit as many members away from, Father Div away from Mother Divine as he could, and he only ended up with maybe a handful of elderly women that needed housing and nursing home care. So he did take these women back, taking their social security checks and everything else with him, and took them back to California. What, much to his delight, that Jim Jones realized upon getting these elderly women back to California is that Father Divine willed a certain portion of his estates and his property to all of his church members. So all of them owned a certain portion. So he had all of these elderly women write the parts of the Divine Empire that they owned over to Jim Jones. The ladies weren't quite into it. They that wasn't part of the bargain, they said. So Jim Jones actually had some of his loyalists fake their own deaths. They would drop dead on Jim Jones' orders in front of these women, and then Jones would resurrect them. Well, these elderly women, which already had a propensity to cult behavior, believed right away that Jones had divine powers and signed their portions of the divine empire over to Jim Jones. However, he didn't read the fine print because every, everything on the member's death reverted back to the head of the divine church and could not be just wheeled out to whoever. So when these ladies died, their portion of Father Divine's empire went right back to Mother Divine. So Mother Divine was still a thorn in Jim Jones' side that he wanted to get away from. But his head is swelling, and now that he 
sees the kind of power he can lord over people i.e. over these elderly members of Father Divine's church, that he decided he can do that to everybody. He already has free reign to sleep with whomever he wanted, wanted to in the temple. He has mistresses living openly with him and nobody questions it. He has people donating all their worldly possessions to him, a slave-like loyalty. He basically just says, I am everything that you will ever need. If you want me to be your friend, I'll be your friend. If you want me to be your lover, I'll be your lover. If you want to be want me to be your father, I'll be your father. If you want me to be your God, I am your God, but you must follow me. And the church's membership has now swelled to well over 2,000 members between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And all of these 2,000 members were not only giving pretty much their entire paychecks from their normal nine to five day or night jobs to the temple, they were also working an additional eight to ten hours every day or night for the temple itself. So they were working to bring money into the temple and then they were also giving the rest of their time to the temple. So you literally had people sleeping one to two hours. In fact, some ex-temple members said it was often a rite of passage, a bragging rite, who could sleep the least. Oh, you, you slept two hours? I only slept an hour and a half. You know, that kind of bullshit. So this is exactly how brainwashed these people had become. They really believed Jim Jones was a the reincarnation of the Messiah, and they really believed that their future lied with him, that American society was about to crumble, and he was their only hope. You also had the temple hierarchy begin to form with the appointment of the Temple Planning Commission, which was women, Carolyn Layton, her sister Annie, uh, Maria, Shaw, Ames, and Marceline. And so these were the ones that were the closest to Jim Jones, and they were all white women, most of them having a sexual affair with Jim Jones. And you started having a lot of people kind of grumbling and s seeing how the hierarchy really functioned, that it really wasn't as open and equal as they had been led to believe because you had a higher echelon of white women then you had another tier which was his associate pastors remember archie Ines is the only black person in that and then you had everyone else which was mostly black so you really did have the same type of social discord or the same type of social evils that you saw in the outside world now starting to take form in the temple you also had a bunch of new recruits in 1973 that actually put forth a manifesto charging the temple with these very evils. They said that the hierarchy was white and that people of color were the lower ranks. There was also a lot of brainwashing and other things that led to dysfunction and disharmony within the temple. And so because of this, a lot of people started to defect. And among them were longtime temple loyalists like James Bean, Associate Pastor James Bean. He, he said peace out, took his family. You had Joyce Shaw from the actual Inner Sanctum, the actual Planning Commission, bug out as well. Her husband, Bob Houston, they had split up by this time. The amount of hours and stuff they were having to work also attempted to leave the temple. He was found murdered on his night job with the railroad, so he didn't make it very far, unfortunately. And Jim Jones started to see his power in the state of California starting to crumble much the way it had in Indiana. And so in 1973, he sent Archie Imes down to, down to Guyana to scout out a potential place to relocate the temple again. And Iams went down, and in 1974, because of, uh, along with Iams and Ames and uh, other, other members of the church, they actually bought 3,000 acres from the Guyanese government. And Houston was not the only mysterious death of people that were considered defectors from the temple. So he was just one of many. So it became kind of a, a thing for people to, to just mysteriously die if they opposed Jim Jones. So right after the purchase of the land, 
He sent 500 people, led by Archie Imes, down to Ghana, and they began construction on Jim Jones' ultimate social paradise. And for a long time, things were really good in Ghana. They worked eight hours a day. They got all the food they needed. It was really good, really good for the early people that went down to Jonestown. Jim Jones was very careful about how he dealt with the Guyanese government. He actually got special dispensations from them. A lot of people say that it was very strange he was able to get the kind of leniency from the Guyanese government that he did, but he was able to bring over lots of money, lots of guns, anything that he would need for protection, and the Guyanese government seemed to look the other way. He also got their blessing on taking passports and other travel documents from temple members once they arrived. Lots of stuff that normal people wouldn't be able to do. Also, he tried to kind of solidify his position in California one last time, and that was because in 1975, temple members had gotten a reputation of being able to show up for any social movement, any gathering that needed to be done, that a temple members could be there in a split second and put out quite a showing. So a lot of politicians started to take notice of that and realize if they got Jim Jones on their side, they could sweep elections with the help of his temple. Now, we're talking maybe 2,000 members in San Francisco, you know. Uh, lots of people said 5,000. I don't know if the People's Temple was ever that powerful in just one city. I'm sure there were five or 6,000 people in all of California, but I don't know about one city. But that, that was the numbers that Jim Jones was said to have could could bring out for politicians. So he caught the eye of a very progressive candidate for mayor in 1975 by the name of George Moscone. It was said because of Jim Jones' involvement and the fact that he was able to turn out people for Moscone that Moscone narrowly won the mayoral election in 1975. Now, a lot of rumors around this. There was a lot of accusations from the other side that people voted twice that dead people voted, the same kind of stuff you hear today. I'm sure some of it's true, just like some of it's true today. So I'm sure it wasn't entirely on the up and up how George Moscone won with the help of the People's Temple. But because Jim Jones did help him pull out a victory, Moscone appointed Jones chairman of the San Francisco Housing Commission later in 1975. And from that commission commissionship, he was able to fill it with temple loyalists and therefore really dictate housing and who got housing and where affordable housing was put in the city of San Francisco. He also became enthralled with other local politicians of the day, Jerry Brown, who would be a longtime governor of California, sang his praises, Mervyn Damley, Willie Brown, who did wonderful things for the city of San Francisco. And surprisingly to me is a gay person, Harvey Milk, who did a wonderful amount of outreach and progression for the LGBT community of San Francisco by being the first councilman, openly gay councilman, elected. All of these people were friends of Jim Jones, and all these people continued to sing, sing his praises even after all the crap started to go down in Guyana. So he was praised by a lot of progressive politicians. Um, the enemies of these people were the conservatives that they had defeated, namely among them Ronald Reagan, who was a governor of California. But Ronald Reagan was a huge point of contention for these people because he did bring a lot of conservative policies to a now becoming very progressive California. Now we know California is a very progressive state with not a whole lot of conservatives in power. In the 70s, it was just the opposite. So Jim Jones was a force for helping bring in a lot of these conservative candidates by bringing out the People's Temple for their votes. And it wasn't just California pop, uh, politicians that loved Jim Jones and that Jim Jones had influence with. You had Rosalind Carter, who was First Lady, uh, during the late 70s come in and meet with Jim Jones. You had uh, Vice President Walter Mondale in the days before the uh, 76 presidential election coming in to speak with Jim Jones, meeting Jim Jones. Jim Jones was among the very few people that went on to Mondale's private jet to meet him. 
and you had a lot of really progressive politicians. So you had Jim Jones um, rising to power in California, especially specifically in San Francisco. But you also had some dissension and some potential warning spots going on. Jones was starting to do things called white nights. These were practice suicides, mass suicides, even while in San Francisco. He would actually bring out uh, drinks to everyone and everybody would drink and be having a good time. Then he would get up and say, you've just drank poison. So he wanted to see what people's reaction would be. Of course, 50-50, a lot of people were very content to die with him. A lot of people started flipping out. What about my kids? What about my family? And from that way, he could see what was really who was really loyal. And he started punishing those that weren't loyal. But he started seeing people that weren't loyal, even in his closest inner sanctum. In fact, Joyce Shaw, this was when her and Bob Houston left the church when he started the White Knights. And of course, Houston, as I had said earlier, was found dead, potentially murdered, not long. Also, Grace Stone, who left him and ran to Lake Tahoe in late 1976, even though her husband, Tim, whom she did divorce, would remain with the temple, even almost to the point of the massacre in Jonestown. He would later defect, but after the White Knights, Shaw, Grace Stone, Bob Houston were out. Late 1977, a San Francisco magazine was poised to publish a multiple part series on the People's Temple, most of it based on the testimony of defectors. And Jim Jones, up until this point, because of his political power, had managed to silence any dissension of the Temple because he had very powerful friends. But this magazine was not having it. And Jim Jones actually was able to get the reporter on the phone the night before it ran and get the reporter to read the first part of it. During the reading, he actually scribbled on a piece of paper and held it up for his temple members to say, we're going to Guyana. We're out. In so many words, he knew that the publication of this article would lead to investigations, would lead to other people leaving. He saw his empire, even with his political power, starting to crumble. So he resigned his position with the Housing Commission, and he and a thousand more of his members flooded into Guyana to join the other five or six hundred that were already there. When Jim Jones came in, Archie Imes, who had been down there from the beginning, he and his wife left immediately. But when they heard that uh, Jim Jones was on the way, they said, we're out. And they actually attempted to leave with $45,000 of the temple's money. He and his wife made it back to San Francisco. They did return the money, but they told Jim Jones they were out. So Archie Imes, his longtime associate pastor, out. That article from New West Magazine dropped the very day that Jim Jones arrived in Guyana. Swelling the population of Jonestown to way more than it could, than it could accommodate. So you had what was, for the early members down there under the control of Archie Imes, a very nice place to be. Everybody had plenty to eat. Everybody had their freedom you could come and go as you please everybody was happy then you had jim jones arriving with another thousand loyalists swelling the population to what would turn jonestown into a poverty camp as well as putting it under the thumb of an ever de more demented dictator by the name of jim jones and this is where we're going to stop part three and next part we'll pick up with the final days of Jonestown in Guyana. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're enjoying this. Really appreciate it. If you want to support the channel, links are down below. Until next time, Keto Comic out. Everybody